guys, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The, the Struggle is Real. Did we really just hesitate on the jazz hands again? It wasn't me. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh God. <laughs> what was it, Ember? The ghost. I was like, God, it's a ghost. Did I think there's a paranormal activity? <laughs> Oh my god. Also yeah, blame I'm the hesitation person. on the delay. Oh okay. right, 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 right. you're right. You're right. You're right. Fine, fine. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. <laughs> oh my god, Amber, you can't just burst into the room. Amber um, again. Amber is all right. in all of our po- <laughs> she's the unofficial fourth co-host. Fourth co-host. And she she wasn't so big. I'd show her camera, but she's she's too big. Um, okay. So today we have Danielle. Jesus Christ, she keeps knocking my hand over so I could pet her. Sorry. Um, <laughs> today we have Danielle, um, who is a phenomenal filmmaker and one of all of all three of our dear friends. Can't wait to jump into the interview with her because yeah. Danielle has done some really cool Amazing. stuff yeah. from doing a spot for Sesame Street, working on The Banker, and even working on Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country. Like she's done. Yeah really big things Mm -hmm. um and she's just super humble super funny can't wait to join into the interview with her um but of course before we do that we got to do our topic of the day um and our topic of the day was we kind of started this topic earlier on in the season (laughs) it's it's coming full circle as we are ending our season Mm. um but quibi it is dead. Yeah, I heard. I and heard that they're shutting down. It. I was like, oh. So what are our <laughs> thoughts on that, guys? What are our Ooh. thoughts? I mean, it's it's weird. Obviously, you want more platforms to put content out there. Mm-hmm. But at least for me, I'm, I'm not going to pay a subscription to see like short films. Bits, right? Basically, yeah. Also, and nothing against short films because obviously we have, we are, our we built our careers in, in short on short films, films and short yeah. films are, are amazing. But basically paying a subscription for videos that are like five minutes long and it's just TV shows in five minutes, it's it's weird. Um, you can bring all of the big talents, all the big names because they were pulling in some big names. But it's not it's not for everybody. Everyone. Yeah. Not, you know, maybe filmmakers will pay um, sub- a subscription to watch short films but not the average human who wants to watch a series a series or a movie or a documentary mm-hmm. watching five five minute videos people will be like i have youtube that's free why should i pay a subscription Again. that was actually my thought was we have youtube we have so many other platforms yeah. that are free why mm-hmm. would we pay yeah. for that yeah. And uh, my other issue was a lot of the episodes felt like like the episodes were just set up. Like we were mm-hmm. just getting like little snippets to like the setup. And it's mm-hmm. like, well, I, I don't want the setup. I want, I want the story. Yeah, the- <laughs> like they weren't good short films in my opinion. Um, and there was, there was something that Sean King, the social activist, said about Quibi that really put some things into perspective about um, about it, which was really interesting. He said that basically the, the two Caucasian people who were able to do Quibi and failed were, were able to have the opportunity to fail, right? Like no one's going after them or like berating them for the, having this idea and it failing, like they had the opportunity to fail. And he was like, think about it. Think about if the people who created Quibi were people of color, they would not be able to fail at this massive level and continue on with their career. Their career would be over. Completely and, destroyed, yeah. I mean, this is, this is nothing on the Quibi creators. It's just as a society, when, when I think about what he said in that like bird view perspective, yeah. I was like, damn, he's right. Like if, if Eric, I, or you and Ryan created Kluby and we failed on that massive of a level, no one would ever trust us with money again. No one would want to work with us again. Like right. our, our career would be over. We would have to find something else to do with ourselves. 
but these mm-hmm. people were able to fail, learn from their mistakes and continue. Um, and, and that just really put some things into perspective for me. Yeah, and, also, and how long was it running? Six months only? Six months. Yeah. I think I think it's also a bad timing because it's right before the pandemic and everybody was like, you know, getting laid off. Well, here's the thing. You would think that because the pandemic, things would skyrocket. Like Actually, how Netflix that's and Hulu and also, stuff skyrocketed because people are home more often. Look at what I, Disney had to do. I think I think mm-hmm. also it comes down to like there's too many competition. There's Disney Plus, there's Netflix, Hulu, HBO, NBC. Uh, uh, there's like a lot of streaming platforms. And like my family has Netflix and Hulu, and we don't we don't want to add more costs. Like we don't want another exactly. Like, if you're gonna that. add another one, you're gonna add I don't know HBO Max or Amazon or Disney Prime. Plus, yeah, or, yeah. Disney or Plus, Amazon not Prime, yeah. Quibi. Not Quibi, right? And it's not, again nothing against the creators of Quibi, but again you have to evaluate the competition, mm-hmm. um, the cost of production, mm-hmm. even though it's five. Uh, what's it called? Five five minute shorts. Um, the cast it's expensive. Yeah. The money is expensive. The quality is expensive. Big um, names. Except big names. Mm-hmm. Also, the whole binging thing. You gonna basically you gonna you gonna finish season one in an hour if you want to. That's <laughs> crazy. You're right. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. And and um, again, it's sad because apparently the way that they close i don't know much of the details but a lot of the creators who were creating shows for quibi are now up in airs i saw um a guy who was creating an animated show for quibi and it's and his all of his uh, hard work and money um it's gone because who's gonna want a five minute animated short mm. uh Serious. Yeah, I, I heard that happen to a lot of people, and that's that's it's really sad because people spend yeah. all this time, money, and energy into something, and mm-hmm. they they basically got nothing to show for it. Not really. Huh. Yeah, Man. I don't know. It's weird. It's it's really weird. Quibi was a really weird thing. It was an interesting. I, concept, I but... yeah. yeah yeah. I just... never really saw it catching on like that mm-hmm. because. Mm-hmm. Especially with like YouTube and stuff like that, like mm-hmm. I, I'll, I'll take an ad if it's like fifteen seconds. If right. like I get my content <laughs> right then and there, and even still, we still have the option to skip ads mm-hmm. um, after listening to them for like what five or six seconds. Right. So I, I, I never really knew how it was gonna fit into the grand scheme of things. All I knew was that they had these random celebrities doing, yeah really and it wasn't it supposed to be for youtubers at first and then oh, was they it? just kind of pushed the youtubers at a side or something like that uh, i don't know I, I i really don't know i know that they do they were marketing as the next big thing even yeah. when we were uh studying at scad um where we did our mfa a lot of the professors uh, of were professors, like this is gonna yeah, revolutionize of, the industry mm-hmm. a lot of guest speakers were also like this is gonna be amazing and i'm I, and from the first time i heard it i was like i don't think it's gonna be that good but whatever and now that uh mm-hmm. yeah here we are here's the conclusion I mean, ryan yeah. what are your thoughts yeah no i was i was thinking like like i said um too many competition and people don't want to add another cost on top of you know whatever subscription you have mm-hmm. so you, you gotta you gotta be like unique like i mean Quibi yeah. is unique in somewhat but, but you know. i guess it's not the right kind of unique right, right? It, it, yeah i guess yeah mm-hmm. so yeah i think if it had came out maybe before tiktok or something mm-hmm. it could have had a chance mm-hmm. maybe. or like but TikTok is free, right? Yeah. TikTok is free. Yeah. yeah. Then, yeah, that's the thing. TikTok or is free. I, I, mean, I, I don't know. It, maybe it could have worked earlier on. I, I think it missed its mark. I don't think this was the time. Mm-hmm. I feel like I feel like if Quibi was free and maybe they added like you know like YouTube like if they added Ad. ads yeah. to make money. Then yeah, oh, for sure. It could have been bit if if it was free in that sense. Mm-hmm. people would have been on that 
Right. But you also missed the mark where, for example, the reason why YouTube was so big was because the everyday person could get on there and do mm. their thing. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if you created an interactive space to where your videos can be alongside like celebrity videos, like, you know, like YouTube in that sense, maybe you would have had a chance. Mm -hmm. But you ostracized it by just making it basically sound bites of short films. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a shame. It's a shame because they had a big name, you know, people there. Yeah. You know. They yeah. they they had uh Kevin Hart, Anna Kendrick, so uh, Chris Turner. Hemsworth. Yeah, Chris Hemsworth. Um, I mean, one of our friends, Kenneth um, Trujillo, he he acted in one of the uh, projects from the, 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 the oh. Kevin Kevin Hart's yeah. thing. Nice. So you see those big die productions Hart in the story. The uh, die Hard. Yeah. Oh, okay. I heard. Um, there, yeah. You see the names of those big productions, and it's just like, whoa! It's like, yeah. this is crazy. It's a shame. It's a shame. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, um, let's go ahead and jump into our interview with Danielle because I think she's in our waiting room. Ooh. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm really happy to be <laughs> with you guys today. Um, I'm really honored to be on your the struggle is real. I love it. <laughs> I mean, you're amazing. We well, love you so much. You're yeah. great. So uh, before we jump into this, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I am Jamaican born, raised in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, I am a writer. I want to be a director as well down in the future. And the Lord opens the doors. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm a poet as well. I love, I love film. I've always had a great passion for film and movies and I've just always been obsessed with storytelling and so pursuing film, um, now in my latter ages, um, is really me just kind of chasing my passion and going towards my dreams. So as a little bit about me, I'm not sure if that's specifically what you're looking for. No, that's great. That's no, yeah. Yeah. great. Um, but I think we also want to know a little bit about what exactly got you into filmmaking. So I think that's something okay. that people should know about you. Especially okay. being Jamaican and you yes. know, being from a, a different country. Like, mm -hmm. how did your family react to you, um, you know, mm -hmm. saying that you wanted to be a filmmaker and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. So growing up in Jamaica, we're very colorful people. So our language is colorful, our music is colorful, our dance is colorful. And so you, you're, you're raised around so much like energy and, and passion that you naturally usually lean towards more artistic careers and such. Um, not everybody, but I definitely lean towards it. Science and math was not for me, let's be <laughs> honest. But um, <laughs> So, oh, wow. so um, at first, well, my dad, Oral McCook, um, big up daddy, he, 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 uh, <laughs> and he, he has his own advertising agency in Jamaica. And I grew up in that company from like working when I was a child, although it wasn't child labor. You know, it was just <laughs> it's different for Caribbeans, guys. Don't worry. It's different. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a choice. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, I grew up around advertising and seeing different commercials and stories come to life across the nation for different brands in the island and also across different countries as well. And so I had a really excitement and interest in like how they were telling these different kinds of stories. So when I was in college, my father was like, are you ready to come and work? No, I was like, I just came to drop for drop by for lunch. He's like, you ready to work? I'm like, okay. He's like, go to your desk. I was like, which one is it? And so um, he kind of just wrote me in and I ended up just being employed. And I didn't know anything about actually like doing advertising myself, but I became a copywriter. And so I started writing for the next four years um just writing ads writing campaigns marketing strategies digital strategies and I really loved writing I really loved the directing part of it and I said you know if I have to be a grown-up 
and choose a job. I think I'm going to choose something that involves movies, TV. I, I just love it. And originally I wanted to move to France and do like French romantic comedies, but then I just kind of moved to America instead. So no, yeah. I'm curious. Once again, why, not why sure if I answered or answer went all the way. <laughs> what did you say? No. No, I said you're fine. Why? Curious to know why French romantic mm. comedies? What about what that I, speaks to you? Yeah. So what I loved <laughs> about French romantic comedies and Audrey Tattoo, that's my favorite French um, actress. I hope I pronounced her name right. I've never tried to say it in front of anyone. Um, <laughs> I love the, the, the magic realism in it, where there were these simple stories but then there's this element of magic this coming to life of the imagination and I just was like this is amazing people are just walking and floating in the streets like this is it just felt it felt like realism and Disney and just and I love French and I love France and I just was like this is perfect this is this is what I want to do right here right here this is my niche um it was that or animation so I was like all right we'll see where I meet in the middle <laughs> yeah i mean that's great so, uh, that's yeah spectacular i mean it's it's great to hear that part of you that i at least i didn't know and i know that we talk a lot but it's crazy to know that that part of you um and uh we also like to talk about um the culture shock that a lot of filmmakers have coming to uh united states because even though it's a recurring question when we have um immigrant filmmakers all the all the answers are different so we really want to hear your experience of how your art changed in your in your perspective your, oh my god my english today your perspective about it's um, the immigrant right, now right it's it's the caribbean in me it's like talk spanish <laughs> it's the puerto rican it's go coming out talk spanish, spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so um when I first moved to, to Atlanta, this is the first time I was really moving somewhere in America to live, live. I had spent two months in New York um, at New York Film Academy doing a short program there before I moved to Atlanta. Um, and it was interesting then and it's interesting now. I find that Hollywood definitely feels like an outside, well, like inside a kind of club. And so you naturally feel like you don't belong and you don't know where the door is. You don't know where the keys are. You have no idea how to get in. It's just a big block. And so you're like, okay, the chances of me actually finding my way to a door are so slim, but I'm going to keep pursuing my dream and pray to the Lord to make it happen. And so I found that coming into film, working on two different sets, I didn't see as many people of color as I thought there should be. I mean, you know, mm. Hollywood has a tendency to be more white oriented than color oriented. And so I was really surprised to see like when I'm standing in a room full of crew members, it's me and one other girl in the corner or me and one other black guy in the corner. And it just felt like, wow, this is actually a real problem for real. Mm. And so that was kind of shocking for me also, mm -hmm. like one of the things that I found, this is more personal for me. I really found myself getting tired of certain types of stories in mm -hmm. film. I ain't trying to be offensive to nobody, but a basic white girl story is kind of, I'm kind of over it for real. Like I cannot watch it no more. No more. No. I can't watch it. Mm -hmm. I agree. I need something. Like, color. There's this I need somebody yeah, that look like me. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's a whole thing. So I know that has kind of inspired the type of stories I'm writing, the type of stories I'm trying to align myself with, mm -hmm. to be yeah. more color oriented, you know, whether it's the voices, whether it's the crew members, whether it's the cast, you know, just make sure that you're surrounding yourself with stories that feel authentic to you or you can relate to in some way because in doing that you're pushing those voices forward so that mm -hmm. when you look on the screen you'll see more people that look like you more stories that you can relate to mm -hmm. as opposed to just feeling like an outsider on the outside on the outside you know yeah so yeah, yeah. no totally agree i mean there's this new netflix show called emily in paris and i i guess i just about a white girl who just 
Aren't you tired of that narrative? Mm. Is it as like it was hard. cheesy as I think it, it was is? hard? Yeah, yeah it's I, and then the I thing is, is like, I don't think we're not tired of telling these stories. We're, like, we're for, not. We're it ain't tired. Well, for for people who didn't watch uh, Emily in Paris, like, can you guys like elaborate? Like, why didn't you guys like it? Okay, let uh-huh. me give you my version. <laughs> you, you go, go. Down. It yet. <laughs> I'm a, I'm afraid that they will never hire me if I ever have to work with these people, though. <laughs> no, Joe, I'm gonna be real though. Us. Let's talk about the story, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a Caucasian young lady who somehow gets an opportunity to move to France. That's already just let's just set that premise there. Who is okay. getting an opportunity to move to France? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, second of all, she goes over there and she's trying to navigate love, sexual relationships, her boss, the liberty, you know, like the freedom movement kind of vibe in in France, where everybody just kind of does what they want. And she's still trying to stay true to who she is, but we don't really know who she is. Right now, she seems like she's a little bit stuck up, like she has all these principles. And I'm like, but then like, but then you go do things that don't match your principle. It just was mm. like, choose who you want to be. And I was like, this thing don't relate to me in any way. The only reason I like it is because she's pretty, the guys are hot, her fashion is awesome, <laughs> and I ain't got nothing else to no, watch. Let's this was you. literally... This was literally like it felt like a reboot of Sex in the City, except younger and yeah. in Paris. Uh, and I was like, yes. we've seen this. Yes. We've seen this countless yes. times. Exactly. We I don't yeah. need another Carrie Bradshaw. I I I don't need to see this narrative. I, I want to see more. Yeah. Like absolutely. It, it's, premise could have been changed if it was like a person of color who was also queer. Now that's a narrative yeah. I would have been down to explore. And- you're the thing queer is, and you're in the city the of love even, show me that exactly I and i think it. one of the things that made me the most disappointed in in the character in a sense and i mean i, I enjoyed it but like the thing that i didn't enjoy as much was that she, she felt like she was trying to be a goody two-shoe which i'm like girl who is that like i don't mm-hmm. know no goody two-shoes i ain't friends with them like i want somebody real you know what I mean? Like I ju- I watched I May Destroy You HBO recently and I was like, that's Ooh. authentic. That's messy. Ooh, that's real. That and I'm like, so I want good. to connect to those characters who mm-hmm. are flawed. And you're like, ooh, mm-hmm. that's a bad choice. I've been there though. You know, as opposed to this, <laughs> no, don't touch me. You know, I'm like, be real, girl. You're not matching your character and your clothes. So, yeah. you know. It was, it it was it really cheesy. Real. Mm, I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was just one of those uh, things. I think you watch to feel good about where you at in life and how to survive twenty twenty. I ain't gonna mm. knock it. It made me smile for a little bit, and then I was like, "All right, cool. Moving on to something else." You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, speaking of stories, what kind of stories would you like to see more of, Danielle? Since we just talked about stories that we don't want to see anymore. Yes. Um. I definitely want to see stories like what I loved about I May Destroy You was how it dealt with the topic of um, physical and sexual abuse and how dynamic and how pervasive and how deeply rooted the pain Mm -hmm. and the struggle can be to Mm -hmm. overcome that, to even reach for healing, how it, what it looks like in, in, um, heterosexuals and what it looks like in in the queer community as well and how they're treated differently in society I felt like it was a very fascinating way to open that conversation so I thought dealing with issues that we we sometimes overlook or just see as stereotypical in the black community or in just colored communities but showing it from a different perspective I think one that's more accepting of um, self-help and Mm self-care and therapy I think can definitely open up new conversations. So I'd be interested in that. I'm also interested in any story to have a black girl in the lead be real. I'm just saying I'll take anything with a black girl. I'm good. <laughs> Especially if she's an immigrant right there. I'm going to watch all of it, right? Mm-hmm. Even if it ain't good, I don't care. I'm going to watch it twice. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I'm definitely interested in colored sto- pe- stories of colored people. Okay, that definitely sounded very racist. I'm so sorry. That's how a <laughs> no. term I learned. Um, people, 
<laughs> no, we ain't, we ain't gonna call him that. Lord Jesus, my history teacher gonna be like, I taught you better than that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm interested in stories about people of color, um, not just black people. You know, I'm talking across the globe, unique stories, stories that are not mainstream Hollywood, that don't necessarily have a Caucasian person as the lead or as a hero trying to save the colored people. You know, those are the kind of stories I'm fascinated in um, seeing more of. And I want to see more of like the Caribbean as well. Of course, I'm from Jamaica. I want to see more Jamaican stuff going across because the thing is, Jamaica is such a small island, but the diaspora is so yeah. huge. I mean, yeah. Jamaicans yes. everywhere and the mm -hmm. impact is so big. But I feel like in our storytelling and our filmmaking, we can do more. We have we we mm -hmm. we need to take and make more opportunities for ourselves to be heard and seen. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's what and I want to make on Daniel's yeah. Netflix. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be the, your, my subscription is gonna be the first one. But staying on that topic of how would you, as a filmmaker, how would you change those stories and? and be an advocate in wherever you are, which is Hollywood, indie filmmaking, um, network TV, streaming TV. How, how do you think that we can truly diversify stories of color? Because we have seen yeah. that, that you can usually tell when, a, for example, Black show, it's being a, a, the, you, it has a, a white showrunner because, um, it's same thing with a Latino show. You see a Latino show, you can tell that it's run by by a white showrunner. It has a lot of white writers behind it. And how can you, as a writer, again, separate um, Black stories from Black trauma, that that's the thing that everybody wants to talk about, and Black people, you, you talk to Black writers, and you know we want to talk about diverse stories. Same thing with, with Latinos. You're talking mostly about immigration and crossing the border. Mm -hmm. A lot of Latinos do not cross the border. You know, mm -hmm. same thing with Asian, Asians in in the United States. How, how can we truly diversify the stories and not what white writers and white showrunners and white directors and creators think of um, us as people of color? Um, that's a very large and great yes. question. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, I think when you were saying it, I thought, I thought to myself, I was like, well, how would I actually do it? I think the mm -hmm. first thing I would need to do is start having conversations with other people of color. You know, mm -hmm. like, like I'd start having conversations with my brothers and sisters around yeah. world just to understand what their life experience was like, understand what has moved them, what has impacted them, what kind of stories have they heard or they want to share, and just start taking in that kind of content and allow that to inspire the type of heroes, the type of characters, supporting actors. Try to build the script with the nature of these people. You know, the experiences that are authentic. As you said, not every Latino crosses the border illegally. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, stereotypes would like to present them in certain ways. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the best way to get away from those stereotypes is to educate yourself on what is it really happening? What's the authentic ratio and proportions here? And how many people actually experience this? Or is it just an illusion made up? So so I would start by educating myself on stories of my stories, my own heritage, not just my Jamaican heritage, but my African heritage. A large problem in the African community, and you can see this in our stories as well, is we are a displaced people, right? Our identities mm -hmm. have been so like taken, stolen, moved Erased. around, shifted, re mm -hmm. in history that our identities have been blurred. And so now you see a lot of people trying to reconnect with the past, reconnect with their roots. And so I think a lot more stories like that need to find their fit, their way to the foreground yeah. and to kind of connect the dots of home to homeland. And so mm -hmm. um, I think kind of jumping into my history, I'd love to learn more about my own history as a Jamaican, as, as an African, you know, in the lineage of Africa, um and and use that to inform more about the type of things i the stories i tell you know so i'm not just pushing more black stereotypes i'm pushing authentic mm -hmm. things authentic insights so i would try that 
Eric, that question was too big for me. I'm not sure if I really <laughs> cut it in slices. <laughs> you did. You did. I mean, you educating did. is yes, a, big, a big part. Um, uh, yeah. uh, for example, Superstore and NBC, when they are tackling uh, issue that none of the writers have uh, confronted, they invite people to educate their, their staff writers. And they have a, a pretty diverse staff write, uh, staff write like group. And um, I mean, it, to hear that, it's amazing, but I'm pretty sure that they're probably one of five shows to do that if they are not tackling stories that aren't theirs. Yeah. So yeah, we need to do better. Yeah. <laughs> one of the shows that I really loved that I felt like explored stories of people of color inadvertently was Orange is the New Black, which mm. I'm not sure if it's true, but I've seen a picture of the writer's room and it was mostly not people of color. And I was very surprised. I was like, good for you, but <laughs> damn. No, was Don't you feel that a little lied to sometimes I mean, when that happens? I felt lied to. Like, like just a little bit of betrayal, like oh my god, what? <laughs> yeah. I was like you're white, but this is a really good black story. Okay, yeah. <laughs> brought a black person in or something, or just somebody really <laughs> conscious. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, what I loved about Orange is the New Black is that when you first watch the first episode, you're like, "What is this, Chapman? I ain't trying to climb into your your life." I'm not that interested. You're going to complain about how life ain't fair while you're surrounded by people who started off different from you. It was upsetting. Mm -hmm. But what I found the show do, do found the show to do is that they would go along and explore the Latino community, the, the, the white, white community, the black community. It, it just explored so many the, um, different ethnicities and races and, and, and religious preferences, sexual orientations. And I was like, this is a very big conversation that they're having yeah. through the mm -hmm. lens of Chapman, which I was like, all right, you need to go through the lens of the white girl to explore the life of everybody else. I'm like, all right, at least we got it explored. Um, so I found it to be interesting. I had to kind of give in. I was like, all right, I'll take Chapman, but I'm really here for everybody else. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 That was one of the shows where I found the side characters to be more interesting than the main character. I literally couldn't care less of, like, no offense, Chapman, but no. I really yeah. couldn't care. Like, Tell, yeah. Show me crazy eyes, please. <laughs> she Get was me great. Like, more of that. Yeah. And yeah. She was fantastic. I, love, I love them. I love them. They were so, they were, they really brought those characters to life and gave them personality. It was, amazing yeah yeah who say one of my favorite <laughs> characters on this show um, and they, oh, they did um, her wrong they did her wrong mm -hmm. I, I didn't like the they way really they did. wrapped her story up they did her wrong no spoilers mm -hmm. no spoilers yeah. <laughs> no I'm, I'm not gonna say how i'm just gonna wrong. say they did her wrong um but <laughs> let's backtrack a little bit because danielle you are one of the few people that I know that have worked on some really, really big sets. I mean, from the banker to, to some more big sets. Talk about mm -hmm. your onset experience and how you were able to get those opportunities for our listeners who are really interested on getting into professional sets. Got you. Should I back it up to Sesame Street? Yes. Back mm -hmm. it up to Sesame Street. Yes, yes because that Super was one of my horn. favorites. <laughs> Okay, no. <laughs> um, so, so when I first moved to Atlanta, I started SCAD doing my grad film program here. And they had an opportunity to pitch a concept for Sesame Street. And I definitely did not think I was ever going to make it, you know, whatever. I just thought I'd give it a shot and be like, all right, cool, I tried. You know, but um, it ended up that when I was there, I, I pitched la almost last. And as soon as I opened my mouth, the um, speaker, she was like, are you Jamaican? I'm like, yes, I is. You know, and it immediately created this bond and she liked my idea. And afterwards she had told, she had told me that I was selected to um, shoot a short film, like a one minute film for Sesame Street to use on their platform. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then I hung up, I was like, what now? What do I, what do, I do now? 
who do I call? And so the first thing I did was connect with my SCAD peers. I called all my friends that were in my production class. I was like, I'm gonna need y'all to roll up and help me, you know, figure this out so it's top quality. You know, it can go on TV, it can make all of us proud. And so we got together and we shot Sesame Street. I definitely had a couple of things I learned while shooting it. I was like, first of all, just like some production things. I was like, you could tell I was early in my degree. But um, I, I definitely learned a lot from that. And so I was able to take that and put it on my resume. And it did premiere um, on, on, on Sesame Street channel. And it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, and so that was good because I was like, all right, cool. I got some work in America. This little Jamaican girl, fill that resume. Yes. And so um, after that, I got an opportunity um, through one of the teachers who was like, hey, there's this guy, um, one of my friends who's like working on a movie and he wants a PA to work for free. I was like, I ain't got nothing to do in sure. I don't need no money. I'm poor anyways. Like, you know, <laughs> you know I'm fine. <laughs> work for free and so um I went to meet him and um as soon as I met him oh him is um William Gre Greenfield Will Greenfield hey, he's amazing Will Greenfield. who we've had on this who we've had on this podcast I think like twice now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I got to meet him and as soon as I met him, it was an amazing connection that we had. He's, a, he's one of the most authentic people you'll ever meet in your life, especially in the film industry. He will tell you, you, you know, like you got to do better. Like he will call you yeah. out by your name. And I'm like, damn, I love it. But then he raises the standard, you know, at which you settle for. And he's like, eh, you mm -hmm. can do better. And then he just keeps building that ladder. And so he opened the door for me and he let me work on The Banker, the movie The Banker. And it was amazing, amazing. I mean, I was in school, you know, so it, when I really think about the amazingness that juggling of work, it? it was hard as hell. Because sometimes we're shooting in um, Noonan. That's an hour away. And I got class and I got to go. But I'm telling you, you know, when God has something for you, it is for you. Nobody mm -hmm. can take it. Because, Whoa. man, like, because he brought me on and he's like, and I was like, wow, this set is so great. Everybody's so nice. They're professional, but they're welcoming, you know, and I didn't even have to twang. I just spoke with my little Jamaican accent and they were like, oh, my God, you sound so exotic. And it was funny, but it was welcoming, you know, and um, I felt like. Will kept telling me, he's like, this is not how it normally is, you know, normally a little bit more intense, people ain't smiling as much, you know, this is a really well-run set. I was like, all right, cool, it's my first one, I'm happy, whatever, you know. <laughs> um, but then there was a moment where we were in pre-production and Will asked me to assist the DP for the day, just kind of help her around as we were doing like um, camera tests and stuff. And I met her, Charlotte Bruce Christensen, and she was amazing. And I was like, I love you. No, I didn't say that. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> you whispered it in her Girl ear. <laughs> and she actually tried to hire a mostly female camera crew. So that mm, was just... Beautiful amazing and I was like this is real girl power right here I mean you know I was I was the brown one but it it was great I was like this is women women man, this is great this is great I'm happy to be here and so mm -hmm. it was so amazing to work with her and then it actually ended up being that I was able to become her assistant for the entire run of production a little bit into post-production so I was like damn this is cool lord you move me from the bottom to the top look at that Jesus yes and so I was very excited and I learned so much and I just felt like I was in a dream walking around and they were making movies I met Samuel L. Jackson Anthony Mackie who in my heart is my homeboy but he I hope you remember me man it was crazy but um yeah, I had a great time. I met Nia Long and it just was like, wow, I'm surrounded by celebrities who are normally on TV. I was like, look at Jamaican girl. Look how far you come, eh? Mm. And so I was overwhelmed, but I learned so much in that, in that time. And there were so many people I met um, that definitely gave me advice. And from that first set, I'm still holding on to those relationships to this day. You know, it's all about networking and being 
being the best you can be, the most polite, the hardest working, so that you can build a good rapport with these people because these people won't be there for you down the road, hopefully, yeah. to help open the doors, to help give you advice, to help yeah. you do different things. And so it was amazing being on the yeah. banker. It was just crazy. Um, and then from the bank, I got some more auditions, no, not auditions, <laughs> interviews um, for some other projects, which at the time didn't really work out with my school schedule because this whole time I'm trying to hustle. I'm trying to hustle and do school and work. <laughs> it's a hard life. Um, but I then um, got a, I got hired on um, Lovecraft Country, which I worked on for a couple months um, and it was amazing. A little bit different from the banker in terms of the pace and the scale, um, but it definitely was, it was an amazing opportunity to meet some of these celebrities again, work with some of the big top people in film as well, and to learn from them every day. There were some difficult moments, but I feel like, you know, it's all about a learning curve. It's all about a learning curve and taking it as it goes and trying to just do your best and knowing when to um, take a step back, you know, mm. so... Yeah. Pick your battles. Pick your battles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the truth right there. Yep, yep, yep. Oh my goodness. I mean, yeah. your, I your resume is amazing. Difference. <laughs> <It's> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, I just showed up. You know, it was the Lord. I just walked in. That's it. <laughs> hey, but you can have the gift, but if you don't know how to take care of it, I mean, sorry, guys, we're having a Christian talk right now. But I know. That, is one oh, yeah. <laughs> that is one of the most talented persons ever. And we are so grateful that you took your time to be a part of the show. And I mean, you're amazing and we love you so much. But before we let you go, we need to ask you a major important question. It is the most important question on this show. And it is. Okay. It's heavy. It's difficult. What, did it, what is your favorite movie and your favorite TV show? Oh, Jesus. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Why you do this to me? <laughs> you could have prepped me with that question a little earlier. No, no, nope, nope. we can't. We can't prep anybody. Yeah. With it. <laughs> My answers are not the most appropriate. You know. All right, I give you the uh, appropriate right. version. Of you. If you need. All right, I can do that. All right. Um. Okay. My favorite TV show. Oh, my favorite TV show is The Peaky Blinders. Oh, um, mm. it, yes. It. Tommy Shelby. Oh. I want to be Tommy Shelby. You know, I, uh, not really, but I want to have some of his energy. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. he goes yeah, yeah, through yeah. a lot of stress, but I want that, that sharpness of his face, that poker mm, yeah. face. I need that. I can't, yeah. I can't poke on nothing. It's just everything, just transparent. So I would love to <laughs> you know, be more like that. So Peaky Blinders is a win. Um, one of my favorite movies is a French movie by Xavier Dolan called Lawrence Anyways. Quite a few people don't know it, and so a lot of people do. But for me, I love that, that movie because it's a story about a relationship that begins heterosexual, and then the man transitions into becoming a woman. And then you see how oh, wow. that dynamic affects the relationship and how the, the girlfriend had to make make like I had to accept it had to come to understand it had to come to empathize and to show love on it at the same time and it was just an amazing it was a very interesting story it definitely resonated within me and then if I had to drop some more I'm gonna drop one that won't be like basic but like awesome is Pride and Prejudice the one uh, with Kira Knightley I'm yes another good, good one ice Feel good ice cream vibe, like with my best friend Dimitri. We chill with Pride and Prejudice. It makes me happy inside. I pretend like I am Caucasian in that time period. <laughs> 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 and um, the last movie I would say would probably be Moonlight because I feel like that truly introduced me to a new form of storytelling. It introduced mm. me to a storytelling of our community in such a unique way that yeah. it felt like you were immersed in it in a new new light, you know? Um, and so I definitely love Barry Jenkins. I've written so many papers on him. He's my favorite filmmaker to write about. I'm like, I will write that essay every day about Moonlight. <laughs> so, 
That's definitely my tops. And Ava DuVernay, of course, anything she makes is magic. Black girl magic. So I'm, I'm mm-hmm. trying to be like her, trying to be like Issa Rae. So we see what the future brings. Yay. Amen. Well, Danielle, we have no doubt that you are going to achieve so much and your name will be synonymous next to Issa Rae and Ava DuVernay and all Oprah right. and all and of the And bigger and girls. bigger. And bigger and bigger. Speaking we into the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I thank you so it. much for being here good good you better receive it just remember the little people you know when you make it big first of all girl um, but- i done told you you figured that life <laughs> so, <laughs> all of y'all. anyways i love you guys and thank you for having me this was amazing thank, thank you. you yes i'll see you later brother danielle Well, guys, I hope you really enjoyed our interview with Danielle. I learned a lot. Um, I I think she said some really amazing things. I think there was a lot of things we could take away from that interview. Um, What do you guys think? What are your thoughts? I think that one of my favorite things, uh, um, I know that Mahalia is going to think the same thing. Um, When she said that, obviously, she's a believer, too. So when she was talking about when God has something for you, it's there for you. Um, yeah, and that's a takeaway for everybody, no matter what your faith it is or whatever. Um, uh, when it's there's something in the world for you, it's gonna happen, and your voice is unique, and your story is unique, and you alone will bring something unique and different to the table that nobody else can bring. So, all the experiences that you have, you should just make the best of them because they're there for you because of reason, and you're gonna learn and you're gonna grow. And I mean, that's amazing yeah and you put the work in today so it can pay off tomorrow exactly so keep putting in the work and you'll reap the benefits someday yeah um ryan what are your thoughts yeah i mean i think uh danielle's a true definition of grit she never gives up she was hustling she she even said that you know even though she was um at school she went on sets and on top of that she was working like trifecta that's that's insane. Like, yeah, I don't know. How I, I remember on. her during that time and she was so stressed out, but I was like, Danielle, like it, this is out. amazing. Yeah. Like you're, you're doing something that a lot of people cannot do to have that balance. That's really right. yeah. difficult to do. And that, that's going to pay off in the future. And as yeah. you can see, it is definitely paying off. Mm, yeah. Um, but sure. that, that is it for today. Um, mm. I hope this, podcast was inspiring for the people who are listening or watching uh please don't forget to subscribe to our channel on youtube apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, uh cast box there are so many other platforms that we're on spotify you can check out our merch store um you can also become a monthly subscriber if you want to help support us so we can continue to bring more content because season three is on the horizon and we have so I'm planning for that. Um, and yeah, just comment uh, and tell us what do you think of our podcast and the episodes and what you'd like to see. Um, and yeah, that's about it for tonight. I hope you guys have a good night. Ryan, take it away. Don't forget to um, keep creating and stay awesome. <laughs> hey. <laughs> okay. See you guys. Uh, I like that little addition there. Okay.